Jamie will be talking about Control Z, undo. How is it? Do you ever wish you could start over, refresh, and um, how we can do that in today's life? So he'll cover. Well, I won't give too much away, but uh, that's what the topic will be today on. Mm. Now, what are some of the exciting um, future plans that we have? Okay, so today might be the last I Discover lecture or seminar we ha might have, but we do. This is not the last I Discover event. Uh, on the way out, don't forget to pick up one of these. It'll appear on the screen behind me in a second. Next week, I believe, we're having the I Discover Picnic and Sports Day. Um, and I heard you're going to kick someone's butt. Is that correct? <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. So if you like to play a bit of soccer, you want to be on my team, by the way. <laughs> so yes, you're, you're all very much invited uh, to come along next week. It's going to be a great day. And it's also a good chance to meet others who've dis uh, attended the I Discover events, to discuss with them any questions you might have, or just discuss any topics in general that you might want to know a little bit more about. Now, before we get Jamie up here to uh, conclude the I Discover series, there are a few uh, house rules that we need to go through. So just um, like every time, if you could please turn off your mobile phones or switch them to silent, we would appreciate them. If you need anything during the surface, just let one of the um, members of the I Discover team help you out. These sessions are recorded live and they're streamed on www.idiscover.org.au. Uh, if you have been unable to attend any of the I Discover sessions prior to this, please log on to www.youtube dot com backslash fountain in the city tv there you'll find the full catalog of uh, uh, lectures and seminars and you'll be able to catch up anything that you've missed uh, we've also got i don't have one with me but we've got some question uh, forms if you have any questions through the series uh, please hold up right there if you have any questions please don't forget to fill one of those out and hand them to the ushers on the way out and your questions we assure you will be answered so without holding back any further, I'd like to welcome Jamie to take us for the final session of I Discover. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome back. And in light of the discoveries we made yesterday, last night, happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. So undo. Let me, actually, let me just start with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray, Lord, that your spirit will be here, that you will open our ears, open our hearts, and, um, and that your words will be heard, Lord. Um, I pray for this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. So who's ever wanted to start over again? A few of you. That's good. I, I have too. I, I, um, I might tell you a little bit about that in a little while. I'm a keen fan of Sudoku. Does anyone like Sudoku? Am I the only one in the room? Ah, oh, some fellow nerds, that's good to know. Um, what I like about Sudoku, it's such a simple thing. It seems to be so complicated, but it's actually quite logical. It's, in case you don't know, there's nine lines and nine um, columns and nine boxes, and the number one through nine fits once in each box. <coughs> I've, over the years as I've done Sudoku, it's made me think about a few other things. I know some people, when they see it, they see all these numbers and they just think, oh, too much confusion. This is just too confusing. I, I don't want anything to do with it. But um, I think they're thinking about a different game. And, and I think Sudoku is an interesting metaphor for life. You have a vertical line, which for me, as I was thinking about this, would represent our, our spiritual um, relationship with God. You also have a horizontal line, which represents, I guess, in a way, our relationships with each other. And then you have all these individual boxes, which I think you could see as representing maybe the different areas of our life, our, our social lives, our work lives, our, our spiritual lives, all these different parts of our, our lives. And, and as we work on each part of our lives, we put them in sync with our vertical and our horizontal aspects of our life, our relationship with God and with others. But one of the things about Sudoku is as you get closer to finishing the puzzle, 
it can be quite frustrating when right at the end you just go, ah, I've made a mistake somewhere along the line. And sometimes you might not know it until it's at the last, the last number or two and you just think, ah, it's very frustrating. Um, if you do it on a computer, you can always press the Control Z button. Now, Control Z is an interesting, interesting choice of buttons for, for the undo function of a computer. It, control and Z. So I, I was thinking about this um, as I was preparing, and we have A to Z. You could say Z is the outcome and A is the beginning of something. So to control the outcome. So we, we want to fix the outcome. And we want to undo those things. Now, like Sudoku and like life, sometimes we go along and we think, you know, somewhere along the way I've, I've made, made a mistake. I've, I've, I've lost sight of one of those, those key areas in my life. Maybe it's a box or an area of our life. Maybe it's our spiritual life. Maybe it's something else that we've missed. We might have um, lost sight of our, our vertical aspect or our spiritual relationship with God or even our relationships with others. Sometimes you wish you could have a control Z for life, for your life, to, to re restart and just go back and make out like some things didn't happen. But unfortunately they have. Over the last few weeks we've really looked at a few things that have um, that hopefully have opened up your eyes a little bit towards towards the, that vertical line in our lives, that spiritual relationship. We've looked at how God's word can be trusted and, and in it we can find hope. We've seen through prophecy that, that God, God's word has been vindicated again and again and Christiana looked at the prophecies of Egypt and Edom and, and we also looked at the prophecies about world kingdoms and how God again and again has been on the mark with this. He, um, he's shown that there's, there's not just, these just aren't words, there's something supernatural here. We have a God that knows the end from the beginning and can be trusted. We looked at the war in heaven and how an angel in heaven chose to rebel against God and, and to attack his law and his character. And how that, that war came down to earth and we were separated from God. But God, in his love, has found a way for us to be restored and, um, and to restore us with his, his, to his law of liberty. And we also looked at his rescue plan and his from above, that he will one day come back and return. And we can see throughout this, and we've really just touched the surface over this I Discover series, but... We, we can see that um, there's a God in heaven that loves us. And maybe that's something that in our spiritual relationship that we've lost sight of. The Bible also gives us wonderful promises about a new start, a new way to, to begin our lives again, not just in the next life but here now. And that's what, really what we're going to be looking at today. In Jerusalem, where the early church started, just after Jesus' ascension to heaven, he told the disciples to wait for a promise that he had given them. And we, fought, we, start this, we follow this story in Acts chapter 2, verses 2 to 4. Suddenly a sound like a blowing, the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, one of those apostles, Peter, one of the better known apostles, was, came outside. Now, at Jerusalem at this time, if you remember, Jesus had just died during the Passover and now was the Feast of Tabernacles. There were people from all over, from regions far and wide, they were all crowded into Jerusalem. Thousands of people. And they saw, and these apostles had just had this experience with this promised helper that God, that Jesus had said he would send. And Peter spoke to them and he told them about Jesus and his, his death and how they'd seen him resurrected and the promise of his, his soon return. 
Now, when they heard this, we follow just a few verses on, the people were cut to the heart and they said to Peter and the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? So what are we to do? We've, we've heard over the last few weeks many things that some of us may not have heard before. We've heard, as we've looked at the prophecies, we've heard about history's greatest hoax last night. We've heard that there are many aspects to the Bible that may have been um, misinterpreted for some time, but that, that we, are, we have a God in, that really wants us to understand these things. But then when we understand these things, what do we do next? Peter answers the, the, apostle, the people that were asking this question back then in the same way that I think we're going to look at today. And he says, Repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. So what's repentance? Repentance is where someone looks at God's character and they see how they've, they've fallen short. In a way, it's like with the Sudoku puzzle before. They've come to a point where they have a moment of clarity and they can see where it's going and they realise it's not adding up. And they've come to, to Christ and they've gone, you know, I've really I've made this mistake. They've, they've accepted his word and they've, they've realised that there is a God out there and they've gone, I, I need help with this. This is something I can't do on my own. But then it goes on to say, and be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. So what's baptism? The word baptism comes from the Greek word baptizo, which means to dip or to immerse. Now, there are a few different forms of baptism today, um, mainly two, I believe, and The one that I'm proposing here today is from the Greek word itself, which means to immerse. So what what does immersion represent? Why why immersion? Why is it so important? In Romans 6, 3 to 4, Paul, speaking to the Romans, says, Do you not know that as many of us as were baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised into his death? So baptism, this immersion experience, first represents a death. He goes on to say, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death. So it's a burial. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. So in this, in this ritual of baptism we find some key aspects, we find that it it represents a death, a burial, a resurrection, and then to walk in a newness of life. So one of the things I love about the Bible is such simple little things can have so much meaning and depth. And and as you meditate on these things, they grow and and your understanding um, enriches and you start to really appreciate things that you see things in a new way. So baptism represents burying the past. Now, I guess all of us have, I don't know, I I can speak for myself, um, but maybe some of us have done things that we really wish we we could, you know, erase or, or skip over, something that we could forget that we've done. Now, if God can undo our past... Does that mean that we don't have consequences for some of our actions? Or does it just mean that God can, he can take on our guilt and our shame and our, our remorse for those things and, and he can take them for himself so that we can, be, we can walk in that newness of life? How can we walk in a newness of life if we haven't passed beyond the 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 things that are um, the results of some of our actions. Now, as I said, there's consequences for our actions, but the feelings, the guilt and the shame, they they stick with us for a long time. There are people in jails that have have murdered and and done some terrible things. They've found this truth and they've, they've found freedom. Even within the cage or the four walls of the cell, they've been free in, in here. 
And that's what, that's what God's offering us. He claims there then that we're innocent, that the, the debt has been paid in full. So baptism, baptism represents burying the past, but it also represents living a new life. So God wants to change our thoughts and our behaviours and he wants to mould our character and our relationships into a new way, something, something different, something unlike the old self. In Galatians 3, 27, Paul says, For as many as of you who were baptised into Christ have put on Christ. Now, what, what does that mean? Sometimes the, the, these are ancient texts and sometimes they use um, terms of phrase that we might not use anymore. But to put on Christ or to put on his, his, um, his gift is it's similar to, to become to represent. We put on, he, he represents us and we start to represent him. Now, there's lots of things that people represent in the world. In sports, they will wear the, the jerseys or the, the logos of the, the people that have sponsored them. So in a sense, they would represent those people. In, um, as I was doing some internet searches, I looked up the word represent and you see all these, um, these kids dressing up like um, gangsters in America and they're all saying, you know, represent. And it's like, what are they representing but, but that old life? But God's offering us something else. He wants us to represent something new, something that the world doesn't, hasn't exactly seen in all its, all its fullness yet. But it's something that we hopefully have begin, begun to glimpse over the last few weeks. So now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. So now we, we, we represent Christ into the world, a world that has, has lost sight of these things and, and wears its um, misery as a badge of pride. So we've buried the past and now we can represent, um, baptism represents living a new life, but it also represents this, this other gift that we started this talk with, um, the Holy Spirit. Following on from where we read before, he said, Baptize and repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So what's the Holy Spirit? Now the Holy Spirit is one of the three persons of the Godhead. The Godhead being God the Father, Jesus, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they are all eternally and together as God. This is no small thing and according to Jesus, the Holy Spirit would do a special work where, where Jesus came and he could be with a small group of people at a time. This Spirit would come and it could be with all of us. It, he said it would be another helper like himself. One of the, the main attributes that the Holy Spirit will do is when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So this process of, of conversion begins with the Holy Spirit. Of sin, where we, we look and we see how we've, we've fallen short. That, that in itself is a gift of the Holy Spirit. He, he brings to our mind how, how God's righteousness is something um, beyond our reach, in our own capacity to reach, that is. And that we will be judged according to according to that to that breach but god has given us a gift he says i have a way for you to come back the holy spirit will also lead us to that way through the truth now in john 16:13 it says when he the spirit of truth has come he will guide you into all truth so what, what is this truth? Where do we find it? Well, we don't have to look any further than the same source for all of these answers, the Bible. Your word is truth. So God's word is that truth. If we open up his word, as we have been in the last few weeks with this I Discover series, we can discover that truth, that truth that 
God who created the heavens and the earth wants to recreate us. So how do we know that we're ready? I think, can, can anyone be baptised? Do I just go, oh, well, if that's all it takes to receive eternal life, can I just, you know, go in the water and it's all done and then go on living as I have? How do we know that we're ready? We find an example, the commission from Jesus, who said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. This was the, just before he ascended. He said, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. So, he wants us to, to make disciples. So he wants us to find people that are willing to hear these words that will be baptised or will, will take on this, this um, new life and they will, will become ambassadors for Christ and then to teach them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Now, if we're not willing to do this, I, I would say that baptism maybe is something that you need to look at a little further on. You need to really experience this love of God. You need for God to you want to, you need to want it with all your heart. And then he goes on to say, and lo I am with you even to the end of the age. Now that's an amazing promise. So God has promised us that he can restart. He can help us to make that new start. And some of us may have thought, well, I was baptised as a young child. I've, I've made that choice already. But have you made that decision in your heart? Is it something that you've, you've assessed and you've looked at and you've gone, you know, this is what, this is what I want to represent. I'm... I'm Sick of all those things in the past that have led me away and have, um, have destroyed my relationships or my, my understanding of God. And, and when we make that decision, we want to we show the world. So what are the steps to baptism? Well, first we need to believe. When we read God's word, we, at first we may be taken aback. We have all these stories that, that span over 2000, close to 2,000 years and we, we may be going, what, what's all this about? But as we study, we start to come to see a God who knows the end from the beginning that has made a way for us to be restored from that place where we were originally. We fell from grace and he wants to bring us back. And when we see this God, this, the love of this God, we, we want to respond with that. We, wanna, we start to believe that it's true. We can't see God with our eyes, but we see the evidence of his love all around us. And so we start to believe and we start to put our faith in this God then we realise that we've come short in some way. We've, we, need to be, we need to pray for forgiveness. We, we've asked, we've looked at ourselves and we've said, God, you're so righteous and I, I fall so far short, Lord, but um, I, need your, I need your love. I need you to transform my heart. And so we, we ask for repentance. And then we continue to grow. While, while when we get baptised, we don't have all the, the answers, we don't have the, the, full, the fullness of, of, and the depth of God's love, which we can only just glimpse but now, but as we, as we grow as a, in our Christian walk, we start to see and our, our belief becomes stronger and we, we, we have that, 
that sense of, of God's love, that we know that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And we will fall, but we continue to grow and we continue to, to reach his standard, to reach out for his standard, and he takes us there. So we've begun to understand God's love and this understanding will continue forever. But how important is following through with baptism? Jesus says to a man named Nicodemus who came to find him in the night when perhaps no one was looking, he said, I tell you the truth, no man can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. So Jesus says that no man can come to the kingdom of God unless he is born of water, unless he is baptised. Now, does that mean that we, there's, we must be baptised? What happens if something happens on our way to the baptism? Or we've, we've learnt these things and we've started to respond and, and um, something terrible happens. Does that mean... is it? some legalistic loophole, you know, sorry you didn't go in the water, um, that, that's it. Or I think here Jesus is saying when we've understood this and we've had that rebirth, our understanding of God has changed and, and we, we want to follow him, then we will follow through with this baptism. And Mark, he says also in Mark, whoever believes and is baptised will be saved. So belief precedes, but baptism, I think, follows belief. Baptism is the natural progression of that belief. We've, we've experienced this and we want to share it. We want to declare it before the world. Recently, I watched an interesting miniseries about the beginnings of America, um, When they were under British rule, the Britons really started to become a bit unfair and started taxing them and, um, and making, un, un, they thought, were unfair, unfair demands upon their, their resources and their economy. And so they thought, look, we want to separate from England, but separate into what? They thought, you know, we can, we can do that, but if we don't have a code or a, a, something to declare that we now represent, something that we're for, we'll, the, world, the, the whole country will turn into anarchy. British rule for that time had kept law and order. But without going into that, Ameri they, they got together, the heads of the different, I think there were 13 states at that time, they got together and they thought, okay, what can we do? And um, they... They thought about it and um, through Thomas Jefferson, I think he started writing out this declaration, what they stand for, their new, their new thing that they stand for, that they, and it's called the Declaration of Independence. In a similar way, when we, we move on from our past, we can say, well, I'm no longer about that. But we really need to say, what, what are we now for? What do we stand for now? So baptism is a declaration. It says to the world, you know what? Now I stand for this. I stand for God's love. I, I stand for the fact that we've fallen short. I stand for the fact that the old way was no good and it, it led me to on a path that would only lead to death. And, it, and I stand for a God that wants us to come back into his love and to experience his joy and his, the fullness of life now, even in this life. And that takes a commitment. In this world, we're, we're beginning a journey together, a journey towards God. And to do that, we, we need to be committed to this. Um, as Christians, we start to follow Jesus' example. We've, we've looked through his word and we've, we've found a, this God of love and his son has, through the life of his son, he's shown us a way, a new way. And we want to follow that example. So we also want to follow that example when it comes to baptism. Now, 
How was Jesus baptised? It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptised by John in the Jordan. Now today the Jordan River is probably from here to that sea along. It's not a very... ...the traditional baptismal site of Jesus. Now no one... I, perhaps don't think it was exactly where they say it was, but around that area, even they admit that it was up on the bank a little way further up because the river used to be a huge river. The Jordan wasn't just a, a little trickle like it is today. It was a, a great river. Now, Jesus came to see John the Baptist there to be baptised, it says, in the Jordan. Now, remember, baptised means immersed. So he was immersed by John in the Jordan, not at the Jordan or by the Jordan, but in the Jordan. So we see in Jesus' baptism, his example was for us to follow through with this, this um, the symbolic, the symbol of, of being immersed in this water, which, if you remember, was a symbol of, his, of death, burial and resurrection. Now, I don't think um, a trickle of water or a sprinkling of water actually fulfills the symbol in quite the same way. If we look at... Um, so, it's a true symbol of his death, resurrection, and, and when we come out, we, we don't stay under the water, we come out into a new life. Is there any case in the Bible for rebaptism? Um, some of you may have been baptised. You may have, at one time in your life, seen the love of God, and you may have, you know, taken it maybe loosely for a while, or you you had a glimpse of it and you were baptised, but you've fallen away. Perhaps some of you have um, have learnt new things that you might want to that. that have reinvigorated your understanding and deepened your understanding of what God's love means and, and the, the depth of what that commitment represents. In the Bible, we find an example. said to him, into what then were you baptised? So they said, into John's baptism. Now, John the Baptist was baptising for repentance by the Jordan. Even Jesus was baptised by this man. And they said, so they were baptised into John's baptism. And Paul said, John indeed baptised with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Jesus Christ, on Christ Jesus. So he's saying... He, even John, acknowledged that there would be, that they should believe in this Jesus who was to come. And then when they heard this, they were baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. I think sometimes we, we might want to be re-baptised into, while we are baptised into the Christ's name, we might have new light, new, new understanding that we might want to follow through with and say, you know, I didn't really, I didn't grasp this point. I didn't understand the depth of this. So we might at that point say, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to recommit my life to this, this fuller understanding that I now have. <coughs> so can we be baptised into the Christian faith and not into the Christian church? Is it just a matter of saying, well, I'll get baptised, but I don't want anything to do with the church? Does that, is that something that perhaps um, you've, has crossed your mind? I, I know it crossed my mind at one time in my life. I thought, well, I really have to be associated with the church. But you know, the Bible says that the church is the body of Christ. God desires to bring those who follow him into unity of purpose. He wants us to, to walk together and to experience his love and to share his love as a body of believers. Now, my experience of the church has, has 
has changed as well over the years. You know, there was a time when I wouldn't be caught dead in a church. <laughs> and um, I, um, and the, I thought, you know, I don't get along with people there. And, um, but, you know, over the years I've found that the church is a place where real unity happens. Where else do you find a bunch of people with completely different walks of life, different backgrounds, different goals and aspirations sometimes, different ways diff from different places, all coming together but serving the same purpose and seeking the same God. I find the church a blessing. The body of Christ is a place where when we're baptised, we're baptised into this body, into this new body. As I said, we read earlier, we're baptised into Christ and we're baptised into this church. But then comes the question, which church? There are so many denominations in the world today. We, we see people teaching all, a whole range of, of doctrines and, and understandings of, of, of the church. Recently around Sydney, have you seen these posters, Happy Science? Um, this man claims to be in touch with Jesus and Einstein and Kant and Aristotle and a host of other people. There's a lot of people out there teaching that they, they, have, they, have, they understand what God, God's purpose is. There's a lot of churches that teach a range of doctrines and, um, and as we saw last night, there was, there's a few, a few of those doctrines have greatly been um, changed and... and we want to know what, how to find the truth. Remember, the Holy Spirit would lead us into all truths. So how do we find this church? So if Christ is the head of this church, as it says in Ephesians, Christ is the head of the church and he is the saviour of our body. So how do I know where his body is on earth? How do I find this church? In Ephesians 4, 4 to 5, it says, There is one body and one spirit, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. So even Paul in the 2,000 years ago could see that, you know, there's, we need this, a unified vision of this church. And, and unity is something that I think many denominations are seeking for again now. But unity into what? It, we need to be grounded in God's word. We need to compare the body of Jesus. Now, the body is made up of DNA, and in a similar way, this code, you can compare it to the teachings of Jesus. Does the, this church teach, have this, this DNA, this same code? Does it teach the same things that were taught and lived in by Jesus for our example? In 2 Timothy 3.15, we find that you have known the holy scriptures which, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus. So these scriptures, they will give us this, this truth. So we need to find a church that, that teaches this truth. Now, a friend of mine says quite succinctly, and I've said it before, it's a very good quote, he says, you don't go to a church to find the truth. You go to the Bible to find the truth. And then once you've found that truth, um, look for a church that teaches that truth. And then when you've, when you've done that, then you can start that new life in Christ as part of the body of Christ. Now, over the last few weeks, um, Christiana and Mike and myself have been um, teaching these things that we've, we've learnt and that we've, we've discovered for ourselves in our own walks. We've, um, this is a new, a new venture for us. I don't think I'm, I've never spoken to so many people all at once before. And, and I've thought, you know, why would I do this? Like, why would someone get up and, and want to share these things? And I thought, you know, I might just share just a little bit about my own walk my own experience with these teachings. I don't, I don't know that guy anymore. <laughs> um, that was a long time ago. I, um, I grew up in the Seventh-day Adventist church. 
Um, and I had a few struggles when I was younger and I was very angry by the time I was 12 and I left the church when I was 14. As soon as I could, I sort of left the church. I, um, I started taking drugs at a very young age. I was, I was an in, injecting drug user by the time I was 16. I was smoking marijuana daily and um, basically taking anything I could. I was right into psychedelic drugs and the world that they promised. I, um, I had a few things that happened in my childhood and, um, and I guess I, I wanted to rewrite that. I wanted to find a way to, to change that. And I thought, well, I'll just change who I am rather than, I can't change that, so I'll just change who I am. So I strayed as far as I could. I, um, I got involved with the, the rave scene in its early days in the early 90s and I, um, I um, had some very strange experiences and I met all sorts of different people. I started encountering um, new philosophies and ideas and the, the psychedelic drugs really, they, they gave me an insight into these ideas. Basically these ideas are known as the occult or, or magic and things like that. I started to see that you know, there's a, there must be another world there. I, I had that from when I was younger and I thought, you know, maybe I've had it all wrong. So I thought, I'll, I'll, I'll suss this out and I'll, I'll follow it through and I'll see, I'll see what happens. So I, um, I started reading um, some books about, about this philosophy and, you know, all these, these experiences that I was reading about, I was having through, through using drugs and, um, and they weren't alien to me. They, they actually made a lot of sense. And they promised that I could, I could reprogram my brain, basically. I could reprogram who I was and, um, and I didn't need God. I could do this on my own. Um, by the time I was 23, I, two of my close friends had died of heroin overdoses. I, um, I was using heroin by the time I was 17. I, um, I was going to parties I, just several days a week. I was, I was taking amphetamines and I was staying awake for up to a week or more at a time. Um, and all the way through it, I started learning these new ideas. And, um, and then after several years, I, I was fairly well versed in, in occult doctrines and, and um, ideas and, and I was practicing it. It seems so innocent. Um, today you hear about the secret. It's basically exactly the same philosophy that, that it's just about some you know, random impersonal thing that you can, you can control and that it, it does your will. But I got to a point where, you know, after seeing so many more, fr uh, more friends of mine had died, really close friends, and, um, and they, their lives were cut tragically short. And I, um, I started, you know, thinking, you know, this, this isn't as fun as it used to be. It was actually quite a, you know, quite a pain. I was committing crimes to pay for drugs, and I... Um, I just thought, you know, this isn't working. But then at that time, the, my occult learning had gotten me involved with people that also shared these things. And like Christ asks us to make a, make a choice and a decision, so does the other world. And they, they, I sort of got to a point where I was, I, was, um, made to, I was asked to make a choice, you know. And that choice I, was basically to to deny Christ. And when this started to happen in my life, my, my world got turned upside down and it was the darkest period in my life and I hope never ever to experience that again for anyone. And I, um, I got to a point where the Holy Spirit started coming back to me saying, you know, this, you know, before, when I was younger, very young, I had a very strong relationship with God, I think. By the time I was, when I was about four years old, I was praying and I really love Jesus, but, but um, Satan throws us a spanner sometimes and it really sends us off. And we think, you know, I must have had it all wrong. But when I got to this point in my life, the Holy Spirit really came back and started saying, you know, 
Jesus loves you. You don't, you don't need to go through with these things, you know. This, this is serious. It started bringing back to my mind what, what it meant, what, what exactly I was doing. And, um, and I didn't like where it was going either. It started to get very hairy and, um, and I was harassed by demons day and night. I had supernatural experiences happening all around me and, um, and it's very hard to explain, but it, I, I was, felt like I was losing my mind. And, um, and then I got to a point where I was so, so depressed and um, I had this dark cloud over me and I, I had a knife in my hand and I, I don't know what I was going to do. But um, at that point... Um, I felt in a really strong way the Holy Spirit stood there and said, you know, you don't have to do that. You know, here I was trying to, I don't know, maybe make up for for my past sins or, I don't know, punishing myself. And the Holy Spirit said, you know, you don't have to do that. That's already been done. And I I was like, well, show me. So within that week I um, I was still smoking cigarettes and, I was still smoking pot, but, but I was in the back of my mind, it was like, you know, what's going to happen? And then on, it was Friday night and the sun was coming down and I remembered from my youth, from my childhood about the Sabbath, something that we, we looked at last night and I thought, I was halfway through a cigarette and the sun was coming down and I thought, what am I doing? So I put it out and I asked God to show me what to do. So I went to my room and... In my mind's eye, I felt like I had angels surrounding me and I, I can't say I saw that, but I felt that. And I, um, I had the best night's sleep I'd had in years and I woke up the next day and there was a, a Seventh-day Adventist church not far from where I lived. So I, I went there and I picked up a Bible and I opened it up and everything I read spoke directly to my heart. It said... The things that you don't want to do, they're the things that you do. And the things that you do want to do, they're the things that you don't do. Who will save me from this body of death? And I read that, you know, I thought, God, God, I'm so sinful. You must, you know, I'm, I, I'm worthy of death. I've, um, <clears throat> I've, excuse me. I've advocated a lifestyle that has led to the deaths of people close to me and I thought, you know, I'm so far from, from your, your image for us. What, what can I do? And I thought, I, I figured that God should probably just strike me down. I, was, I thought that's what he would do. But I kept reading and then the next thing I read was, for I didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but that through the world, that through Jesus, the world might be saved. And that changed my whole understanding of God. At that point, I realised that God doesn't want to condemn us. He, he's desperately trying to bring us back to him. And I hadn't, I hadn't done this as a formula, but I had basically in that moment I had repented because I saw the error of my ways. I saw God's righteousness and I... Um, and I surrendered my will and I thought, if that means you'll send me to hell or whatever, that's, that's up to you. It wasn't about going to heaven, you know. Oh, if, I'm, if I do good, I'll go to heaven when I die or anything like that. Right now, I just needed, um, I needed to be free of my past. And he did it. He, um, at that moment, I felt the Holy Spirit say, look around. So I did. And what... You know, with with the occult ideas, I was everything was a symbol of death. All of a sudden, I was surrounded by death. It seemed like, and um, and I looked around, and all of a sudden, that was gone. And I was like, something's happened, and I couldn't put my finger on it. So I went home, and I um, I stayed there, and I was thinking, you know, I I feel silence, silence, you know, in my in my heart, which is something I hadn't had for a long time. <clears throat> and then my flatmates came home and they said, oh, where have you been today? And I said, oh, I, went, I went to a church and they just sort of rolled their eyes and I said, I, said, I gave my heart to Jesus Christ and they, were, they couldn't believe it. <laughs> I, um, I, at that moment though, I felt this flooding joy into my heart 
And um, it was indescribable. I, I felt free. And, um, and it was everything I was looking for in my life. I, um, <clears throat> I really, really want that to share with everyone, that you can have that experience, that there is a God out there who loves you. He loves you with all his heart. He, um, he's doing, doing everything he can to bring you back. He, he knows what, where you've been. He knows why you've been there. And he forgives you. Now, if you've heard some things over the last few weeks that you haven't heard before, and your heart's been hearing and um, responding to these things, and you've thought, you know, there is, there is something out there that makes so much more sense. There's something, I don't want this misery in my life anymore, that God's, God's law, his, his law of liberty has set me free, and I want it to set me free. I want to, to repent and be, be a representative of Christ. If you have thought that... Um, you know, that there's, that there's too much at stake, that it's a lot to give up to change your heart, to change, to change your lifestyle. If you've thought that, that, um, that it's just it's too much, well, I just want to tell you that it's not enough. The world can't offer you anything compared to what Christ has offered you. Um, now... I want the ushers to hand out these decision cards. Now, for me, I haven't looked back. I am... my life's completely different from when I was younger, yet I'm still surrounded by, by um, these things, the things that I was, I was surrounded by back then. I, um, God's led me into a new life where I, I get to, to work with people that are going through similar things that I went through, and I get to share them with them, um, God's love, just through my actions and, and my words and... Um, and I just hope that you can make that, that choice as well. Now, on the decision card, the first, the first question says is, I accept Jesus as my saviour and I want to know him better. Now, if you have, have never thought of this before or if you're um, just starting to learn about Jesus, and, and you want that kind of influence in your life, I just ask you to tick that box there. Now, some of you may have learnt, um, have been learning and on this journey for some time, and you may have learnt some new things that have really brought home to you the fact that God, God really wants you in his kingdom. He wants you to be part of his, the body of Christ and to be, to be a new person. If you tick that second box, it says, I appreciate what Jesus has done for me and I want to start a new life for him by being baptised. It's my prayer that, um, that if, if you have caught a glimpse of Jesus, that, that, that you would want that for your life, that you can experience a new life in him. And finally, the last point is, I have some questions and I want someone to visit me. Perhaps you've just started to investigate these things and, um, and you'd like to know more, that's perfectly all right and we'd be happy to come visit you and to share in depth more of these, more of these truths that we've found that have transformed our lives. I know there's many people in this room that have experienced this love and this, this transformation in their own lives and, um, 
and any one of us would be glad to share that as ambassadors of Christ. So when you finish that, just um, hand them back to the ushers and I'll, I'll close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, for what you do for us in our lives. Um, I'm eternally grateful for what you've done in my life and, and I, I just want to share that with others, Lord. I want the world to know the peace that you can bring and um, that they can be freed from the mistakes of the past or... Um, even just their misconceptions about you, that you can transform them, Lord, so they can have a clearer picture of you, something that that gives them a new reason for living, meaning and purpose in their lives. And I just thank you, Lord, for the um, chance for us to to hear these words and to, to respond to them. And I just pray that your Holy Spirit will continue to guide and lead us in all that we do. In the name of Jesus, who died for us on the cross, that we can be of new life in him, I pray. Amen.